Hello, uh, uh, good uh, evening, uh, good afternoon, sorry, <laughs> not the evening. <laughs> Long day Tired. Uh, to, uh, to all of you here in the room, but also um, hello to all of you that are uh, watching us uh, online. Uh, I'm uh, Mirek Dushek, I'm Managing Director um, at the World Economic Forum. Uh, this is uh, the uh, humanitarian briefing on uh, Gaza. Um, and I uh, just wanted to make sure that uh, you know that uh, for us uh, at the World Economic Forum, uh, this issue is of uh, utmost uh, importance. I also wanted to be clear that, of course, as you all know, uh, uh, it's a, a very polarizing, uh, there is a very polarizing atmosphere right <coughs> now uh, around uh, uh, this issue uh, globally. Um, I have been part of also the preparations for the annual meeting, so I just wanted to make sure you all know that this is something that uh, we have put a lot of thought into. Uh, it is a very sensitive period right now, and this is not the only session that is going to be looking at, uh, at uh, uh, Gaza and what is uh, taking place. Uh, as you can imagine, there are a lot of political leaders uh, that are here uh, that are addressing that issue. Uh, earlier today, uh, we, for example, heard from the Qatari Prime Minister. We will have here the um, uh, uh, representative of uh, President Abbas, uh, Mr. Mohammed Mustafa. Uh, we will have many other Arab leaders here and foreign ministers uh, addressing this issue. We'll have a lot of international leaders addressing this issue. Uh, just uh, this afternoon, we will have uh, Jake Sullivan here from the United States. We'll also have Anthony Blinken uh, here. Um, and we will also have uh, the uh, President of Israel here, Mr. Herzog, uh, on Thursday, uh, who will also be uh, providing um, uh, his perspective uh, on, uh, on uh, the war in Gaza. So I just wanted to be very upfront about it. It's a very, very polarizing issue right now. We felt it was very important that we uh, have uh, this discussion for us to be able to understand what is happening on the humanitarian front in Gaza right now. Uh, and I'm joined for this here uh, by um, leaders that uh, I have tremendous respect for. Um, uh, Jagan Shapagain, uh, you are Secretary General of the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Society, so a warm welcome to you. Uh, Kitty van der Heyden, uh, Deputy Executive Director at the United Nations Children's Fund, UNICEF. Uh, and Samer Khouri, um, Chief Executive Officer of the Consolidated Contractors Company. Uh, I've known you for a long time, uh, a Palestinian business leader. Uh, we've worked a lot on many things. I know you, how committed also you are, of course, uh, to your people, also how committed you are uh, to peace, and also how much you're doing right now. So we'll hear from you, because I know you've been traveling uh, to the border a lot um, uh, there. So let me kick it off uh, with you, Jagan, if yeah. I may. Um, so your federation, as I said, it's a federation, yep. so you are relying on the national societies, both uh, Red Cross and the Red uh, Crescent. Um, more concretely, uh, in Israel, uh, you work with Magen David Adom, uh, you work with the Palestine Red Crescent Society, but also you work with the national societies in Lebanon, Syria, <coughs> Jordan, um, Egypt. Um, so let us uh, understand um, what you are hearing and seeing from those different actors that I just mentioned so that uh, we can get a picture of the, the situation on the ground. Of course, we're really all concerned about uh, the situation of uh, civilians uh, in this war. Thank you, uh, and thank you for having me. Uh, you rightly said we are the Federation, so we actually work with the national uh, structures, uh, Red Cross, Red Crescent, or in Israel, Magen David Adom. Um, and the number of countries you mentioned, these are all very, very important. 
And, and each of the, uh, the Red Cross Red Crescent societies are doing the humanitarian work in their own countries. Uh, in Israel, uh, when this painful death happened on 7th of October, uh, the Magen David Adom was first on the scene to, to provide ambulance services and taking them to uh, the medical facilities, uh, and also now continuously providing the, the mental health support, and particularly to those families whose, uh, whose family members are in, in, in captivity. Mm -hmm. And this continues. And, but of course, in Palestine, the Palestinian Red Crescent has been a very active organization for many, many years, uh, but primarily focusing on the, on, on the health services. Uh, and right now, because of this supply chain constraint, the, the, the primary supply is coming from Egypt, and the Egyptian Red Crescent is, is, is mandated by the authorities to be one of the primary organizations to get the supplies into, uh, into, uh, into Gaza, and it's, it gets handed over to Palestinian Red Crescent, and then Palestinian Red Crescent works with many organizations, including the UN organizations, to make sure that the goods get distributed. Uh, and then, uh, of course, the countries of Lebanon, Syria, Jordan becomes very important because uh, we hope that the you know, conflict doesn't become a regional conflict. But if it becomes, God forbid, it doesn't, but if it does, of course, it's very important that we have preparedness in other countries also. Uh, I myself, I haven't been to uh, inside Gaza. I did go to, uh, up to Rafa border in very early days of, the, of, the, of this, this phase of conflict. Uh, primarily, uh, from the humanitarian point of view, what we are seeing is uh, uh, the health uh, uh, healthcare crisis, basically. The health facilities, a majority of them are not working, even the ones who are working face uh, you know, power supply, water supply, medical supply. Also, the doctors and nurses have been overworking 24-7 uh, uh, you know, in, in the early days. So, uh, so the healthcare system is absolutely in a, in a, in a very, very uh, difficult, difficult shape. And the Palestinian Red Crescent doing those works for a very long uh, period of time, uh, uh, like the Al Quds Hospital, you know, it stopped functioning because of the lack of uh, the, the, the power uh, and the and the and, and the medical supplies. The water and food have been the other areas of major uh, major major constraint. I think the food. Uh, I think you heard uh, a number of uh, uh, reports also saying that you know, the 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 you know some reports of saying that starvation could be coming. Uh, and the water is, is, is a major thing, and I'm sure Kitty will talk about more in detail later. Um, the, 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 the clean drinking water, uh, basic water, is, is, is a major, major, major issue. Sanitation becomes a major, major crisis. Of course, this could create a secondary, uh, a secondary impact. So I think the, so these are sort of, the, in a very briefly, the humanitarian situation we are hearing. You know, the food, water, health, a fuel, shelter, um, the education has basically stopped. Uh, so these are major crises. But also working on the ground, the, 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 some of the challenges faced by the, the, the staff and volunteers has been, of course, a major mental health challenge on themselves, because a lot of them also have lost their families. Um, the access is an mm -hmm. issue, and of course, the safety is also an issue. A number of staff and volunteers have been killed. Uh, 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 by now, so major humanitarian gaps inside Gaza, but also the safety and access for the workers remains a major challenge. Can I also ask you, uh, because you read about uh, the border, yeah. so for people to be able to understand, if you have some reading on then um, the situation, uh, particularly with Rafa, how, how does it actually work right now? Yeah. So basically, as I witnessed that myself. Of course, that was uh, uh, in, in the early days. So mostly what happens is the goods coming from Egypt, as you know, the northern Sinai, Al-Aris, that's where the sort of the goods get collected. That's where the warehouses are. And that's where the trucks get loaded into. And once the trucks get loaded, they have to go through a scanner, the, 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 it's scanner in the Egyptian side just to make sure. Uh, that uh, uh, the Egyptian authorities are compatible with what are crossing the border. And then they go to Rafa border, and from there they had to drive around 60 kilometers to go to the scanner managed by the Israeli authorities. So they have to pass through the Israeli scanner and drive 60 kilometers back. So basically 120 kilometers they drive just to get the, 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 the security clearance through the scanner. <coughs> and if the truck is rejected, it means that then they have to go back to Alaris, offload and unload again. So once they, they come from the, the, the scanners, then they cross uh, from the Rafa border inside Gaza, and there they have to uh, offload the goods uh, uh, coming from Egyptian trucks into the Palestinian trucks. 
uh, and then they get uh, uh, distributed, working with all the other uh, other organizations working together, <coughs> it gets distributed. And there, a lot of challenges is, of course, there had been restrictions on the number of trucks that can uh, that can enter. But also, even if more trucks enter, the challenges is with the fuel on the in, in Gaza side has been in the early days. It was a major major challenge. It is still remains a challenge. But also then getting the trucks and the drivers to get to the areas where it is needed the most, particularly in the northern Gaza, becomes very very difficult. Thank you. And finally, if I could just, because you, uh, as I said at the beginning, you work with all, all those national societies. So after uh, uh, the attack on October 7th, also help us understand what uh, Magen David Adom was doing within Israeli society. I think the, that's part of your federation as well. The, the, the primarily, the, the, their support was basically getting the, uh, the, the injured to the, to the hospital. Because they have been very strong on the emergency medical services. Uh, so that's sort of their, initially, that's sort of the major support uh, they provided in the, in, in the early days. Uh, and then, uh, increasingly, of course, providing support to the families. Mm -hmm. And of course, there is also, uh, 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 you know, there are missiles uh, uh, coming still into, uh, into Gaza, both, both from southern Lebanon and also from Gaza. So if they sort of hit the, uh, any uh, uh, habited areas, and if uh, anybody is injured or if they need support in Israel, okay. in, in Israel they do that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for this 360 <coughs> of, yeah. of what your organization is doing right now. If I could move to UNICEF. Um, so obviously you're known uh, uh, by the work that you're doing for children, and uh, uh, of, obviously children are immensely affected by the war and, and, and there is a lot of suffering. Uh, so how do, you, how do you see the situation on the ground from your, um, uh, from your colleagues uh, that you have there? <coughs> if you can also just describe to us the situation as you see it. Um. Look, if there's one word that would describe the situation of children in Gaza, it's catastrophic. Rewind, catastrophic. That's just what it is. You know, there is no one and nowhere that it's safe to be as a child in Gaza at this moment. Children and civilians face the 3D. Death from the sky, disease from the lack of safe water, as Jagan was highlighting, and deprivation because of the sheer lack of food. Now, let me elaborate on all three of them. One on the death. Let's not forget that we are 100 days into a terrible conflict which started with horrific, atrocious yeah. acts in Israel. But we now have well over 23,000, close to 24,000, people reportedly killed, and reportedly about 59,000 people injured, maimed, and God knows how many are killed still under the rubble. 70% of those are women and children. 70%, that's what comes from the sky. In terms of drinking water, people in Gaza at the moment have one and a half to two liters of water each day for everything for cooking, for drinking water, for hygiene, everything. The minimum standard in emergencies worldwide is 15 liters. The critical threshold for survival is three liters. That is what we're talking about, catastrophic. And then coming to the food situation, as Jagan was mentioning, this is nothing short of catastrophic, and we have never seen the levels of deprivation. Let me reiterate that. We have not seen the levels of deprivation we are seeing now. We have 100% of the population in Gaza that is categorized in IPC3, food insecurity. That's crisis. 50% of the population in IPC category four, and no less than 25% to one in four in IPC category five. That means catastrophic levels of food insecurity. And all of this happened in the time span of three months. So this is not just the depth and the severity of the crisis that's affecting children. It is also the speed within which this has happened. And we need urgent collective action to really address 
the situation for children on the ground. As we have said before in UNICEF, Gaza is a graveyard for children, and we cannot allow that to continue. So if you want, I'm happy to talk about a few of the things that are needed. Please. <laughs> um, so we call it the four R, just to keep it very brief. One, we need the R for reach. As humanitarian actors, all of us together, we need to reach people in need, children, civilians, women. For that, we need two things. We need access. We need not two border crossings, we need more border crossings, including in the north where reportedly we don't know about 300,000 people are that have hardly seen any humanitarian assistance. We need, in addition to that, for reach, an immediate humanitarian safe, a ceasefire. Right? We cannot move from A to B if bombs are falling and people cannot come to distribution sites. So access means border crossings and a humanitarian ceasefire. Secondly, we need respect for international humanitarian law. We have not lost as many UN staff as we have ever in the history of the UN as now. 152, and I know, Jigan, you have also suffered tremendous losses. Our condolences to you as well. But we also know that 73% of schools are damaged, 70% of primary health care is damaged, according to WHO, 50% of municipal wash facilities. So we really need to talk about how, war is not our thing. We care about children. Every child is the same, but we need basic facilities so we can enable basic services to be delivered for children. So that's the reach, it's the respect. We need resources. All of us, all humanitarian actors, were critically underfunded to deliver what is needed. And last and not least, let's not forget there are still children abducted. As far as we know, at least to one of them, a small child that was abducted when he was nine months old will turn one year tomorrow. These children need to be released safely, unconditionally, and immediately back to their families in Israel. It can be done, but critically, it's not happening at the moment. Thank you. And also, of course, uh, you said it also in, of course, the October 7 attack, a, a lot of children uh, perished as, yes. as well, which, uh, so overall, this is just uh, confirms uh, uh, how, how, uh, how we need to work toward peace long term, uh, which brings me to you, Samer, because uh, um, as you know, the World Economic Forum has been always committed to providing a platform to when, when there is a different situation and hopefully at one point uh, the guns will fall silent that, that, that uh, the region can move to a sustainable peaceful solution, just to say that. Um, but we are where we, where we are. So I mentioned at the beginning that you are now very active on the humanitarian front. Uh, so if you can tell us a little bit about what you're doing and I know you also have some proposals. Basically, I think we have to realize that we cannot depend only on the international community and humanitarian aid. We as a Palestinian private sector, trying to help as much as we can, but using this audience and your good offices, I have four specific requests which I think will help the humanitarian situation in Gaza. Number one, hospitals. As we all know, there were 45 hospitals, maybe now less than eight are in operation, specifically the ones in the north. Even. So a specific suggestion, I live in Greece. Many volunteers from Greece as doctors are willing to go there, and I'm sure other countries will volunteer if there is an arrangement made between uh, Europeans and Israel, let the European doctors, nurses, and more important medicines mm -hmm. to go. So that's one specific, choose a hospital in the north, a hospital in the south, let the European run it. This way Israel doesn't say it's a military operation. Number two. Water. There is three main pipelines that deliver water to Gaza. Today, one only is operation in the south. Let us make a task force between UN, Israelis, and Palestinians, and we'll fix the pipeline. Because you said there's a problem of water. If you let the water pipelines work you pu and, uh, and get diesel in, because there is existing already purification plants, immediately you solve the water problem. Number three, power. Before this war, Gaza used got three sources of power. Israel, Gaza power plant, mm -hmm. and from Egypt. Now let's start with Egypt. Allow Egypt, because the overhead lines are still not bombed. We can tomorrow make a task force between Egypt, Israel, and the UN, and let 
power going, and that would go a long way. Finally, I have to say it, unfortunately, that now we are, as, after so many years of a Nakba, we're back to tents. But today, 700,000 people are living with nothing on their head. So one of my main tasks, and I ask everyone to volunteer tents, normal tents, because as I said, <coughs> half of these 800 people are kids. So if we can all at least make a task force with your good offices and retire to work on these practical suggestions. Thank you so much. Um, we have about um, seven minutes um, left for this briefing. I would like to now open it up to any <coughs> questions uh, people may have uh, uh, in the room here, if you can introduce yourself, and if you can always say who the question is for. Thank you. So I, I see the lady there, and then uh, then Sarah. I think first the lady on the left over there, and then Sarah. Thank you very. Hello. Thank you very much. And uh, my name is Razia Alkoch. I work for Agence France Press. I'm normally based in Brussels. I had questions for Mr. Uh, Chabakan. Yeah. As someone with a name that's Turkish, I <laughs> hope you, uh, I understand as well. And for Miss uh, van der Heyden. <laughs> yes. um, we've heard from some other organizations um, that there, are, there is no safe place to give birth. And because you both sort of alluded to the experience of, of the healthcare issues, I kind of wanted to go into that issue more of how women who have small children, women who are pregnant, just generally what the experiences um, of women in Gaza are and how you would describe the conditions in Gaza for women at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you, if you want to. Um, Look, I think we're all very lucky as women in this room that we're here and not there. We have 155,000 pregnant and lactating women in Gaza. We know that on average, on an average day, we have about 135 deliveries. And we also know that about 25% of those need life-saving medical care, i.e. C-sections or other. The critical care is not there. So women are suffering. Children, as a result, are also suffering. And if you are a woman, and I mean, uh, you know, there is one toilet in 700 people. There is one shower in, I can't remember, I think it was 7,000 people. Just imagine if you're a menstruating woman or a lactating woman, or you are a young girl that's menstruating for the first time. And just imagine the sanitary conditions you are under. That is what life is like at the moment in very crowded, unsanitary conditions in the South, and that leads to a high disease burden. And pregnant women are obviously very vulnerable, and we cannot offer them the care that is required. So from, from a gender perspective, this is not a neutral crisis. Women suffer, and particularly pregnant women suffer. So I would love to get medical care in nutritious food in because nutrition, lack of adequate nutrition for pregnant and lactating women is a serious health problem uh, and we need safe conditions for deliveries and that requires hygiene which we don't have. Sugar? Yeah, no, I think that's really covers. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Sarah, please. Thank you very much. I'm Sarah Pantoliano from ODI. Thanks to all of you for um, making very clear what the situation on the ground is and, and Kitty particularly to you for the moral clarity in describing the situation of children. There is one thing when it comes to why we see less political action that we would like to see in addressing the humanitarian crisis. Um, that is the way in which the crisis is discussed in the media. At the eye, we've called it the politics of narrative. You know, when, when we hear um, children in Gaza talked about, we hear under 18 or um, people who die or under 18 who die, there is a real difficulty in actually saying their children are being killed. How can we make sure that our advocacy breaks through this challenge in the media that is you know, making the narrative quite distorted? Who is it for? Whoever wants to address it. I mean, you, of course, UNICEF in particular has an advocacy voice, but all of you. <laughs> 
Uh, no, it's a, it's a very hard one, Sarah. I, I, I really don't have a, a prescription. I think when you look at the how uh, some of the crisis gets uh, uh, reported, of course, there is a, a, a mainstream media where I think at least there is a, a degree of, uh, of editorial processes. But at the moment, the news doesn't get circulated by the mainstream media. It's mostly through the, the social media and among friends and uh, uh, from a very informal, uh, informal channel. Uh, so, and that makes the, 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 the development of a narrative extremely, extremely difficult. Uh, and, and what we are also seeing now increasingly is uh, the, 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 the social media sort of sips the, sips the narrative. And increasingly also the, 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 the political decision makers also get heavily influenced by how the social media, media sips, sips the narrative. And that's what makes the, the, the dealing with the crisis uh, in today's age much, 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 much harder including for uh, humanitarian, humanitarian work. Uh, because a lot of times, of course, uh, you know, our mandate and our capacity is to try to bring the humanitarian assistance and reduce the, reduce the human suffering. But because of some of these debates, even th these things become increasingly complex. Um, and, uh, and, and, and honestly, I wish I, I, I had a straightforward answer to this question, Shara. But this is clearly an issue that needs to be worth discussing. And that's one of the reasons I love the topic of this forum, where you, know, you focus on rebuilding the trust. I think that's sort of the critical element that's missing in the world, and it's sort of getting <laughs> less and less available. Yeah. So really wanted to thank you for, uh, for choosing that topic. Thank you. Anyone else wants to react to it? I think it was uh, the lady there. Uh, can you, uh, uh, microphone please. My name is Fatma Wahidi. I own a children's center in Colorado. My question is for you, Mr. Dusik. It's that um, we're here in Davos 2024 annual meeting. And honestly, there is one session. You said this was the biggest humanitarian crisis what we've ever seen in, in lifetimes, bigger than World War II. And yet, if you look through the agenda and you see the people talking, there are bigger sessions for Ukraine, which we already discussed it, which is still a crisis, but the amount that the, Palestinian, the people of Gaza and the Palestinians are being focused on, I'm sorry, you said in the beginning that we have so many sessions, that is not true. I mean, we all have the agenda and we can see. It's just some of the leaders may or may not mention it, but it's not a focus of the World Economic Forum when this is something that is huge. And these children that are suffering, these children that are suffering today are going to be the children in 15 years that may cause suffering, the same suffering that we're seeing now because of all of what they're seeing and what they're going through. And I don't think that the World Economic Forum or any of the international companies are taking any of this seriously. And to me, it's not about today, it's about my children, my three children, that I worry about what's going to happen because of all the crisis that these children and these people are suffering and seeing. So what, what, what is happening at World Economic Forum, you said? That, that, what, is, what, what is on the agenda also, other than this forum? No, thank you so much. Uh, uh, like you, I, uh, and we take it extremely uh, seriously. Um, and thank you for the, for the comment. Now, um, what I mentioned at the beginning is um, uh, what we um, are implementing here. So if, for example, if I look at the session this morning with the Qatari Prime Minister, most of the proceedings, now you can say, okay, it's a discussion, but uh, that's, we provide a platform for dialogue. Of course, there is others that then can catalyze action. That's why we have uh, a lot of leaders from different uh, stakeholder groups uh, here. Um, uh, but really, the leaders that I mentioned at the beginning are appearing here. Also, just to be very clear, we have invited uh, President Abbas. Uh, we, we have, uh, and as you know, Summer, we have, I have personally worked uh, um, with many uh, Palestinians and Israelis for the past 16 years. So I know the, uh, I know the region, I would say, quite well for someone who doesn't live there. Uh, and uh, so if I look at, uh, and so as I said, President Abbas nominated Mohammed Mustafa to be the representative, and he has a dedicated session that will be uh, in the, pro it's, it's advertised in the program. Um, we have also the Jordanian Prime Minister here, who 
um, I, I would expect would be also addressing this. We have many foreign ministers coming. Uh, now, it is not enough. That's why we felt we needed to also be able to provide this platform for people that are working on the ground uh, in Gaza. Um, and I know many of you, uh, I mean, you firsthand, and you have colleagues that are, that are there and you have visited. So I, uh, first of all, fully agree with you how serious this is. It is uh, very important to us also because not only me personally, but also this organization has been quite active on this. You may remember we had here um, uh, Chairman Arafat at one point uh, and um, it is, as I said at the beginning, it is not, and I fully agree that this is hugely, um, at a human level, hugely difficult. Uh, now, uh, I will say it again, we will have here Arab leaders, we have here the Israeli president who will talk on Thursday about, among other things, will address, for example, the uh, situation of the hostages and uh, will be, of course, uh, pleading also for their release. Um, now, uh, it is really a political process right now. For example, the Qatari Prime Minister was here on the record saying that uh, they are, of course, uh, trying to uh, mediate, as they do, uh, for, uh, in terms of what will be given, in, uh, let's say, uh, what, what is uh, on the side of hostages with regard to the cessation of hostilities. It is a very raw moment. Uh, I just wanted to assure you that for us this is extremely important, that's why we're sitting here, but this is not the only thing we're doing. Uh, and I'm very happy also that we have a, a lot of stakeholders among the Palestinians, among the Israelis that have been engaged with us, and we hope that our role is not really military, our role is not security. This is a tragic moment and we hope that at one point we again can play a more productive role. So this is just uh, in reaction to you. And again, thank you for the comment. I think we're out of time. Uh, so I think I have uh, uh, one more. So there is the lady you've been, you've been. Yes, please. Thank and you. And then we'll close the session. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Lynn. I'm here representing the Global Shaper community. Um, and uh, so I wanted to pick on something you mentioned, uh, Ms. van der Heiden, thank you so much for your comment. And, and as Sarah mentioned, your moral clarity as well. Uh, we have initiatives where we're partnering with organizations like ANIRA that you may all be familiar with that is working on the ground in Gaza now. Uh, one of our shapers actually is at the Rafa crossing and helping with delivering aid. We also have shapers in Palestine, including in Gaza, that every few days tell us that they're still alive. Um, I, I wanted to pick up on something, Ms. van der Heiden, that you mentioned, um, the, the need for humanitarian ceasefire. Um, how, it, it, it seems that that's something that Anir has been pushing as well, saying that in order for us to really deliver aid, that humanitarian ceasefire is really critical because it's not only to prepare, pr uh, pr provide support for the, the community, but also to the aid workers who are supporting. Um, and, and I wanted to ask for your, your thoughts, especially from your advocacy point of view, how can we collectively help push for the ability for that humanitarian ceasefire so that you're able to do the work that you need to do in the community and so that the community itself stays safe? Thank you. Thank you. Look, I think that we have been clear and outspoken as I would say the humanitarian sector writ large, but also I think across, you know, the, uh, almost across the political spectrum that we need a humanitarian ceasefire, that the violence cannot continue, that people are suffering, really suffering, and that there needs to be a political solution. So I think at this moment, what we can do is use, for example, opportunities like these created by the World Economic Forum, created elsewhere, to keep asking and advocating that we cannot allow the human suffering we see at the moment to continue. And for us as a humanitarian community to alleviate the plight of people Children do not start wars, but children are suffering the consequences that we advocate for that humanitarian ceasefire because we cannot deliver like this. And it's not just the people that are there, it's also you know, the people that Jagan has lost, that we have lost. I have staff in Gaza and I'm incredibly proud, let me just say that here, I'm incredibly proud of our people on the ground writ large across the humanitarian spectrum that stay and deliver. We have colleagues that have lost their wives, four children. They managed to get one person, one of their sons out of the rubble, and they're still there because they believe that we have to deliver for children that have nothing to do with this conflict. And I hope that everyone can look into their heart and think as a parent rather than a politician, and then finally we can maybe get to a humanitarian ceasefire.
Thank you so much for spending the time. Thank you so much also for participating and uh, wishing you a productive week here. Thank you. Well said. And now I couldn't get the point across.